Hello, everybody. Once upon a time, it was in the dark end of the last century, we had a conference in the last castle which was built in, in Europe, uh, which is, has a tradition of building castles, but this was the last which was built up in, a, in the beginning of the 20th century. And in this meeting, I, I was in duty for having, traveling around people which have landed on the airport Munich, and, and I, I heard something. Mark Spitz is, was seen in this conference. And I was surprised because he's not a particular rheumatologist. Of course, he's well known in Germany because of his maybe eight Olympic medals. And another gossip was uh, is, uh, there's Carlos Santana is with us. And uh, also surprising is a great musician, but not expected in a rheumatology workshop. And, uh, and it turned out that both these were not Mark Spitz, nor Carlos Santana, but it was Keith Elkin. <laughs> this time, that time he, he looked, uh, he, could, he could, maybe he's not swimming fast enough, but he, he could uh, substitute for, for Mark Spitz or for Carlos Santana uh, easily. So that was our first uh, meeting in the maybe 80s of the last century. And so uh, th by chance we had a very, uh, at the time I guess she was in New York, uh, special surgery. Yeah, uh, we had some some parallel movements uh, with with in our scientific life, which which were which were done accidentally because we we did not. Uh, I I try to remember whether we published something together. I'd, I'd, I'm not sure. I I don't find something. I I looked in the internet, or even the internet does not know something about this. We have to change. We are now old enough to 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 make, maybe write something together. I, and I will now start with uh, my new uh, topic, which I'm working with now. Is, this is not anymore the lupus disease, but uh, I work with the neutrophil uh, activation, and the neutrophil activation in conditions, especially in the case of gout. We go to gouty arthritis. And to make it more easy, I have a, I have a number in the, in the left corner, which means M. That means mononuclear phagocytes. When I'm talking about mononuclear phagocytes, there will be an M. If I talk about granulocytes, there will be a G. And that's to make it very easy to understand how to shift around. It's no doubt that uh, IL-1 beta is involved in the gouty arthritis. And when you neutralize IL-1 beta with anakinra, you will immediately wipe out uh, gouty arthritis that, um, uh, and the pain. And that means uh, there is a clear contribution of the mononuclear phagocytes since the granulocytes don't make uh, IL-1 beta. But uh, the question is, who is initiating all this stuff? And this will be different, as you will see in a minute. Here you see now, you see a mononuclear phagocyte, and uh, they, they enter the, the crystals. They even seem to be attracted by the crystals. Nobody knows how. And then they, they take up the crystal, and after taking up, their cells swell. And this swelling is a very important issue because it is related to the activation of the inflammasome, which is a, the basic uh, molecular uh, entity producing IL-1 beta in, the, in humans. Now, look for this. We, we see, maybe there's a laser pointer? No. I will, I will, go, I will have to go there. You see easily, this is a, the shape of, the, of a granulocyte. Uh, which has not taken up anything, and if you feed them with crystals, the granulocytes increase their size. This is the first, there's, there's, there's a granularity, this is the first action, and the second action is they decrease their size. And the size is uh, reported usually as a swelling. And as you see here, the sodium concentration inside, thank you, the sodium concentration inside the cell is not changed by the by the uh, up contact to the crystals, it is little changed by the by the swelling after taking up the crystals, but is strongly changed after swelling the cells is swelling and is uh, uh, producing uh, this granular structure. And this sodium is very important because you have now to to envisage the following model of uh, IL-1 beta production. This is a phagocyte. This is lysosome. This is a crystal. The phagosome inside is potassium. 
Inside cells usually there's potassium and very little sodium. The crystal is basically built from sodium. It's sodium urate. It's a it's a it's a sodium bomb in a way. So we we now take up these crystals into the phagocyte. Then we release the the lysosomes will go to this to this uh, phagosome and they release the sodium from the from the crystals. And now you see the sodium is increasing dramatically inside the cell. But now the cell is hypertonic. There's too much too much ions inside, and so this cell is attracting water molecules, and the water molecules pass the aquaparines, pores in the, in, the, in the membrane of the cell, and they dilute down the, so the ions inside, but now the ratio from potassium and sodium has changed. And if this potassium is lower than 80 millimolar, automatically the inflammasome starts. So we have, you see here, this, this here, is uh, the swelling process. You also see here this cell, which we, I, should, I don't know whether I should say this, but we are not in the Bible Belt. We call this deep throat. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, we, we, we see here that the low potassium sodium ratio, which is generated by the release of sodium from the crystals, the inflammasome activation, the pro IL-1 is cleaved, the IL-1 is secreted, secreted maybe not the right word, maybe it's just popping out of the cell which is already dead. And that causes inflammation, and this inflammation is related to the gout disease, as you see, and is made a product of the mononuclear phagocytes. So, summarize, the mononuclear phagocytes activate the inflammasome and produce IL-1 beta. Maybe there is some extracellular maturation of IL-1 beta, uh, by neutrophil-derived serine proteases. That's what we intended to investigate in, in more detail. A way to work with old-fashioned cells like neutrophils, discovered already 100 years ago, and the answer is very simple. Old-fashioned cells do fancy things, and without neutrophils, humans die. That's, I think there's an argument to go for these cells. Currently, the science uh, tends to go to CD65 positive whatever cells, uh, which, uh, which you can find in every third human you, you're looking at, and they're very rare cells, and they have to, supposed to be very important. I, I, I'm, I accept this. This is very important. But the neutrophils are as part, important as well. And now you see here what is the neutrophil. There's a multilobular nucleus. Yeah, This cell has a magic portion, which is very toxic to bacteria and fungi. And they, they are ready to eat this material, and they can also form nets. Yeah, and this is the version which is not activated. But if it's activated, it will go to beast mode. <laughs> <laughs> and now they will develop, they will develop the very strong uh, antibiotic, which is called uh, ROS, reactive oxygen species. This is killing everything. This is also killing, of course, bystander cells. This is killing, uh, in the case of a thread of bacteria, fungi, or parasites, which cannot be controlled by eating or by netosis, yeah, you need some very strong bomb to destroy this pathogen on the, on the coast of that you have to give some collateral damage, as it is called usually, uh, to the tissue. That means this bomb should be put, controlled carefully, not to, to make too much uh, damage, instead of uh, removing bacteria. So, then now we, we will, I have to have summarize the neutrophils, the body's navy seals. Highly invasive, lobulated nucleus allows fast migration, equipped with fancy carry-on toxic bacteriocidal and fungicidal weapons, ready to neutralize several kinds of aggressors. But there's also an altruistic part of the neutrophils' life. If neutrophils if it's required, they can act as suicide bombers. Then they, they give their lives in, uh, on, on, to help the, the body to survive. They can launch the biotoxic oxidative burst. I called you the beast mode. Facing a superior of aggressors, neutrophils externalize the chromatin and make a net from nets and these nets immobilize bacteria as well as fungi. If the mission is accomplished, neutrophils die silently by apoptosis. 
This is long uh, known, and this is also one of the one of the first uh, topics where we where we, we came together. With, I came together with uh, with Keith. Though that uh, the apoptotic cell death is a kind of a uh, altruistic silent pathway, uh, maybe may inducing tolerance, not inducing Im Im immune response, but tolerance, and uh, and this is uh, still true. Uh, several other things from that time have already been modified, but this is still true. Just to summarize, highly invasive toxic weapons neutralize aggressors, altruistic pathway, oxidative burst, net formation, apoptosis. Uh, we usually discredit neutrophils uh, as simple soldiers, but we, we should consider them gladiators. They are, not, they are not just simple soldiers. I will show you in, 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 a, in a minute that what happens when you take away the neutrophils. Basically, if you will ever been asked which cell you want to give from your blood for short term, maybe two hours or three hours, don't take neutrophils. Take T cells, B cells, macrophages, whatever, but don't take neutrophils. You will not survive two hours without neutrophils. Now, we go for, for now we go for a gout disease. Uh, you see the acute gout attack with a edema in the, in this, uh, in the, in the hand, and you see the intercritical gout six weeks later. The same, same patient. The same patient, the, the same tofa. You see the tofa here are the same locations here, like this, yeah? And, <clears throat> but there's the uh, gouty attack is faded, and there's not any more inflammation. It's, uh, the hand is not uh, inflamed, it does not uh, hurt, and it's, it's, it's basically fine. However, if you look for the x-ray, the crystals which you have uh, as an uh, etiologic agent of the gout, they are still basically unchanged. And, uh, and this is, uh, how to say, this uh, is a, was a big question. Why, why is a crystal inducing an inflammation? The inflammation is fading, and the crystal is still there, why don't they reintroduce the inflammation? And that's what we are working in the last years, and uh, this is a summarizing. Acute gout inflammation usually resolves within a few days, but the crystal deposits remain. So now look for this, which is this. You see here the crystal of the of the MSU, which is a, so it looks like a needle. It's a hundred to five hundred micrometers in, in, in size. And you look here. What you see here is only the nucleus of a cell. And you see these cells which touch the crystal. They do some fancy things with the nucleus which is a just exploding nucleus. The nucleus is exploding, and it's not a matter of the condition. You look for these cells here, which are not in touch with the, with the crystals. They still remain in a, in, a, in a normal way and in a normal shape. They are just healthy cells, but when they touch the crystals, they seem to be exploding. And that's not seem to be, they do explode. This uh, ejection of the DNA is a very dramatic stuff. And uh, this is accompanied by the production of several cytokines. As you see here, it's uh, IL-6, MIG, uh, IL, uh, this should be IL-1 receptor antagonist, and uh, MCP-1, MCP-2, this is chemokines. There's also TNF, IL-1 beta, which is very low here in this condition because this is made from accompanying uh, uh, mononuclear cells, and much cytokines here, it's the IL-8. You see, this is a logarithmic scale. This means from here to here means 1,000, 100-fold. Okay, that means this is a, this is a basic, the, the most important uh, chemokine produced from these nets within a, the, the contact time to the, to the crystals. And now we uh, have some clinical top, topology, which is not, it's just an artificial word. If the tophus is generated newly, there's a short period of self-resolving inflammation. If the stable controlled tophus, silent, non-inflammatory, that was a picture you saw it on the right side. There was no inflammation, but there was, the tophus seems to be controlled. The tophus grows, short period of self-resolving inflammation, but also tophus shrinkage, very important for urate-lowering therapies. Yeah, also, we get an, an, an increased risk of flares. And there's also a short period of self resolving inflammation. Usually, if you make some uh, urate lowering therapy, you give a little bit of colchicine to avoid this uh, contra uh, reaction. 
The TOFUS resolution is usually silent, non-inflammatory, but if you have an uncontrolled TOFUS, there's chronic inflammatory response. And what is an uncontrolled TOFUS? I will show you in a minute one example of this. This is now the synovial fluid from a patient with gut. As you see, this is not a really nice cell. This, all these cells are already dead. But when you look more carefully, you see the crystals here. They are stained artificially in yellow. And this is now the DNA. And you see the DNA is sticking around here out of the cells. And when you see uh, clearly, it's not with the best exposure here. You see that the crystals are always connected to these DNA molecules. That means the DNA is somehow capturing this, this, these particles and form a structure uh, which is uh, uh, avoiding the mobilization of the crystals. The, the, the body does not take the crystal for a crystal, it does take the crystal for a pathogen which is potentially able to move around the body. So uh, this crystal is, is captured as it is viable. But we, did, we do this mistake and this is also inducing all the gout disease. Yeah, is that if we would not, if we ignore the crystals, they will not be so dangerous for us, not so painful. But we do, and though they are painful. You see here this, and uh, the question is, now we go to, we have already deep in the granulocyte field, neutrophil recruitment, net formation, IL-8 release, neutrophil recruitment, that, this should be a very uh, unlimited uh, reactivity. Whenever you have one uh, neutrophil uh, released, and some nets are formed, and aid is released, you, sh you should continue with, it, with, this, with this thing. But this is obviously not true, because uh, otherwise we will consume all our neutrophils by the first attack of something and by the neutrophil activation. And in this case, we can consider that this is circle is, is, has something is not right in this circle. This is not the, the truth. And so, how to interrupt the vicious circle of net formation, neutrophil recruitment, and IL-8 release. And by chance, now we did a very stupid experiment. We calculated how many neutrophils we find in the tissue, we find in the synovial fluid. And this is a very high density, it's 10 to the 8, up to 10 to the 8 PMN per milliliter. And when you add these neutrophils, you see here, that's a small piece, to the crystals, you see that the crystals are clumped together in a very, in a very uh, efficient way. And uh, this is only a movie for about uh, t 20 minutes. It's, yeah, 20 minutes. And in this 20 minutes, uh, the cells uh, start to clot together. And when you go for the next next morning, you see that in this culture, there you see these tofus have been formed that look very similar to those tofus which you can isolate from the patients or from the animals. And that means if you take this tofus out yeah, and check you see that all the crystals are collected into this piece and it was wrapped with DNA and that means it's an immobilized, it's an immobilized thing here. And now, at high de neutrophil densities, nets tend to aggregate in vitro. And now we looked for the cytokine profile. We expected huge amounts of cytokines as a supernatant. But what, surprisingly, uh, the, sup the, the activity of, the, of, the, uh, of these, uh, of these um, uh, um, chemokines and, and cytokines were rather low. That means when, the, when the, a net is formed and it opens the DNA, they release much cytokines and chemokines. If the net is a very dense situation and they aggregate, they do not let out the cytokines. That means as the density is increasing to a very critical point, that seems to be something around 20 million per milliliter, 20 to 50. In this case, the, the, the nets trap their own cytokines, they have developed a very strong proteolytic activity and they degrade the cytokines. <clears throat> and that's why the, the, um, the, the reaction of the, of the um, vicious circle between IL-8 <coughs> recruitment and, and net doses is uh, broken by this uh, fact that the aggregated nets tend not to produce much more but less cytokines. So even look here, this is also measured, but this is basically not detectable anymore. Nets sequester and degrade inflammatory mediators. So now we have to shift a little bit the gears, and now we go to the animals. We have an animal, which is a wild type animal, and is a cultured in, in, a, in a cell culture medium, we add a little bit PBS. And then we have these uh, cells, 
we add uh, MSU in PBS. That's why we add here PBS as control. And you see here now that uh, the strong net formation, net formation is a red, is a red colored material. And then we have a mouse which has not, is not able to produce the beast mode, the, the reactive oxygen. And this mouse uh, has a little bit more nets here, but you hardly see it. But there is no netosis induction by MSU crystals. That means this mouse is not able to make these aggregated nets. And now we have to look what, what will this mouse uh, experience when they challenge challenged with the MSU crystals. So NOx deficient mice display reduced capaci capacities to form nets. <clears throat> and now, this look for this. This is 100% foot thickness. We injected into the foot, the crystals, yeah, and after one day, in the acute phase, you see there's no difference. There's a strong inflammatory response in the NCF mouse and in the wild type mouse. This is basically this day. Even the NCF mouse has a little bit more. But then there is a resolution of inflammation due to agnet formation in the wild type situation. So the mouse is after 46 days, it's in the chronic phase, it's, the foot is, uh, is already uh, healthy again. But here you see there is another episode of increased uh, foot pad swelling. And this foot pad swelling I will show you in a minute is not edema, this is bone formation, no bone, bone, new bone formation. And that means this, this uh, inflammatory response, which is controlled in the wild type. Yeah. We are wild type, usually. It's not controlled in the, in the NCF mouse. This is uh, CCGD disease, chronic granulomatose disease. This is basically the, the, the animal model for chronic granulomatose disease. This is not able to control the inflammation after the uh, initiation. And this is... Uh, a condition which, which, in this case, we stopped with 46 days, but it, I'm sure that it will, will last forever. And what is the consequence? In the wild type, the bones remain very, uh, uh, very nice. This, this is the metatarsal bones from the foot where we injected the, the crystals into. And this is the NCF mouse, and you see here, you see a very strong bone neoformation, which, and which is related to the prolonged inflammation in, this, in these bones. And also in the involvement of the ROS. This is now the electron microscopic picture of the normal bone, and this is uh, these, uh, one of these uh, strange bones formed in the, in the NCF mouse. And when you look for uh, cl more clear, more close, you see that this bone structure has nothing to do with a regular bone structure. It's a spongy form bone formation, and this bone formation is basically what you also see in the patients when you, when you have... Uh, the gout, uh, prolonged, uncontrolled gout disease, you see sometimes bone loss and bone sponge formed, and bone sponges are formed also as in a kind of uh, osteophyte. Oxidative bursts required to resolve MSU-induced inflammation. That's by a consequence. Why cytokines are responsible for bone destructions? Which cytokines are responsible? We, just to make it short, anti-IL-6 helps a little bit. It does not really uh, re make a completely... Uh, has a bone, but it's uh, it helps a little bit, and uh, I'll, uh, one beta I have not shown is also involved in the bone uh, destruction. When you take it away, then you will get some better bone, but it's not as in a normal healthy situation. Which cells are responsible for the bone destruction? This was kind of surprising. We we well, this is the experiment here. You we injected the PBS or the MSU crystals at day zero. And then we have 240 hours where we can monitor the animals. And in this time, we, we depleted the neutrophils. We started already 85 hours before we inject, and then we depleted three times more. And that means this mouse is running with only 15% uh, of the neutrophils, which is usually in this, in this animal. And the mouse have anyway a little bit less neutrophils than humans. And here we harvest the tissue. Now this is the normal response. Within, a, within the first hours, yeah, you see this is a mouse which is, which is completely healthy, and then it goes down to at, at 10 days, the, the swelling is almost, uh, is almost gone. Yeah? But what happens with a with mouse which, which without neutrophils? There's, the initiation is very slow, but then it's uncontrolled. So it means the neutrophils are not only involved in the initiation of the inflammation, but also in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, resolution phase. 
This we have to consider being a function of a soldier, but this is a function of a general. And that's why we can exact think about the healing competence of the, of the neutrophils is widely overseen in the, in the field because if healing is already implemented by the, by the action activity of the, of, the, uh, of the neutrophils and it includes the net formation. The net formation is a healing device. And uh, you see here, if you take away the neutrophils for 10 days, you already see the bone is, is affected as uh, in the NCF mouse. Neutrophils are required for initiation and resolution of MSU-induced inflammation. And now, we are, we are looking here for this. This is the new, are neutrophils endowed with the healing hand of death? And you see here, there's some figure, it should be a little bit more dark, but there's a, a figure which uh, with, a, with, a, with a weapon, and it should look very dangerous in a, in a graveyard. But if you look closer, this is, this, is a, uh, this is a healing hand of, of death. It's not only that the cells die, but the dying cells help to heal the tissue where they are dying in. And this is, uh, uh, sometimes it is worth a second look. Okay, so what's about mononuclear phagocytes? If, you, if we deplete mononuclear phagocytes, we can only do it for, for a very short term. You see the bones here are very destroyed, but here you see if you make an early or late depletion of the of the mono of these uh, of these uh, inflammatory monocytes, they also contribute to the to the uh, activity. As as you may have seen, the, if you remove the neutrophils, there is still some activity, and this is also related to the uh, inflammatory monocytes. And uh, early depletion monocytes decrease pore swelling and bone erosion. Late depletion. It's the decreased neoossification. So, this is the inflammatory monocyte. It's involved in inflammation, pore swelling, bone erosion, and neoossification. That's the summary. But it's not the driving force behind all this. The driving force behind all this seems to be the granulocyte. Now we go for the mouse. We are we, we, do, we don't want to go to the feet, we now want to go systemic. This thing, we make the air pouch. An air pouch is a, is a uh, air bubble which is injected into the, it's like a, a carry-on baggage. And there you can put in things to investigate the inflammatory response, uh, maybe in the peritoneum. But in the peritoneum, it's more dangerous because there is a gut, there's so, so many organs, and you, if you inject, you may hit some of these and give problems. So we take this one, this is very, very easy for mice, and we can control it with a laser. There's a, a space in the back of the mouse where we can, where we can do the in vivo experiment in a container, which is with a good sub blood supply and everything. So as you see here, the wild type mouse, they produce these tofu structures, and these tofu structures, they sequester all the crystals in the, in these, in these structures. When the NCF mouse, as you see here, is of the way of doing this. And that means, uh, is there a difference in the inflammatory response? There is. The wild type mouse, they have hardly any cytokine uh, to be found inside. We, I look, we looked for interferon, which is a T cell mediated. The I won't be there was monocyte. This one is uh, from several cells and this as well. And as you see here, the, all these inflammatory mediators, either from the uh, lymphocytes or from the monocytes, are increased in the NCF mouse because since they have no tofus. And the question is now, when we put a tofus from a wild type mouse into this container, is now this resolved or not? And the answer is, is very simple. If you put in an aggregate, aggregated net from a wild type uh, animal, you see the uh, cytokine is uh, destroyed already uh, uh, as, as it is in the, in the wild type situation. That means this tofus has an activity to degrade cytokines and chemokines and, uh, and structures which are inflammatory and, and, and fueling inflammation. And you also see this here, if you put it, uh, the cytophus into a solution of cytokines, you see that they are uh, uh, degraded where the controls uh, remain flat. And this is now the situation, we have circulation, the circulating of the many cells. We have the resident macrophages inside the, tofu, inside the air pouch, and when we inject the crystals, yeah, uh, there is the, this monos, uh, this uh, resident macrophages. They they somehow uh, address the circulation and keep in the cells, and the cells are then uh, eating up the crystals. In the case of neutrophils, 
they will eat the crystals, and then this is always found on the surface of the membrane. It's never floating free. This is also included into this, into this uh, clearance process. The crystals, which are captured by the nets, are not floating free, uh, freely around, but they are kept to the surface, inner surface, of the, of the peritoneum or whatever, of whatever tissue you're looking at. And to immobilize these crystals, and then, uh, then they, it can be processed uh, as, as good as possible. So oxidative bursts is required to resolve emission-induced inflammation. And the question is now, are nets good or bad guys? This is a neutrophil making nets. There are two possibilities. Good is fight and immobilize pathogenic microorganisms. Bad, fight innocent material and chronify inflammation. That's basically MSU crystals. <laughs> the question is, what about egg nets? Yeah, and the egg nets, uh, the good egg nets initiate the resolution of inflammation and they shield necrotic areas from other parts of the body. The bad egg nets are involved in obstruction of vessels and, of, and they may also occlude ducts. Uh, honestly, this phase was different when I had this presentation outside of the United States, but in this case, I did not dare to change and, to, and so I take this phase and a more neutral phase. Um, for this uh, bad egg nets. So, as you see here, this is the situation in the pancreas. We had an IL-17A transgenic mouse, and this is uh, without transfection. The mouse, the pancreas is perfect. With infection, the pancreas is invaded by neutrophils and, and, and macrophages. And when you look for the ducts, you see the ducts of the pancreas are heavily occluded in this condition, and uh, this occlusion of the duct is related to net formation, and then the, the, the occluded ducts get inflamed and the, you get a very acute uh, pancreatitis. And if you have a part four knockout mouse, which is not able to, to make the, as this egg nets, they, or, or has a loss, less activity to make egg nets, these mice are protected from the disease. Pancreatic ducts uh, are occluded with egg nets and part four mice are completely protected. The role of neutrophils is not merely the first line defense, that's what we have to learn. There is also some healing function, some uh, shielding function, and also some organization of the immune response. And uh, this is a team who did all the work. They, they did not want to show their faces because they know my uh, unlawful jokes. I usually do. And, but all these people, I can, uh, if everyone wants, I want to show you. This is uh, uh, Luis Munoz, and there's uh, uh, Jonas Hahn, Mona Biermann, uh, Ira Majowska, uh, and uh, some of them, are, uh, Ricardo Schaurio, and, and that's, that's all the people which are involved in the, in the work, and to make it more easy, we, we put here the, the names uh, uh, which are helping us uh, with much help from my friends. Maybe you know the song that is called A Little Help from My Friends, but in this case it would be wrong, it has much help from my friends, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>